do you ever find yourself wanting to play with dreadnoughts? You know, like any sane person does. But your mum or your wife, they say no. Apparently it isn't socially acceptable anymore to fix your problems with 35,000 tonnes of steel and triple 14-inch guns. I asked about quadruple 14-inch guns, the answer was still no, unfortunately. But you, you like the look of dreadnoughts, and you, you want to keep the look, and model making, although it looks nice, it's quite tough, and it takes a very long time to make one, and well, if you make one, you have to make two to make a friend, and then you, you can't just have two, so you need to have three, and then if you have three, then the two pair off, and one gets lonely, so you really need to have four, and then why, why stop at four? And you, you start to see the problem with space here. There has to be a better way. Well, guess what, kids? There is. This video is sponsored by my favourite shooty shooty clicky bang bang boom free to play online multiplayer game in existence, World of Warships. And no, this isn't just a PR line for the game, I've been playing it since the closed beta, and I have the boats to prove it, I started with the Grammy Ashi. You can play with so many different ships these days, not like back in my day when there was only two or three ship tech trees. No, no, no way. If you haven't looked in a while, then you're missing out. There are so many different ships now, and the team is always adding so many more. I just logged back in to discover how fun the new British battle cruisers are. The game is not just a game, it's a digital museum, and I genuinely use World of Warships to help with my scale modelling and colour mixing. If you're ever in my Discord, you'll know I'm an avid scale modeller. The level of detail is extraordinary, and on top of that, you can also use ships that were designed and never built, like the baby I'm leveling up for, which is the G3 Battlecruiser. I mean, look at this magnificent thing. But there aren't just battleships. There are submarines, there are destroyers, there are carriers, and best of all classes, the cruiser. Seriously, cruisers are the best, and I will fight anyone on this belief. New content is being released every single month, whether it's new ships, in-game connations, cosmetics, or even ship classes. You can always count on enjoying a fresh gameplay experience in World of Warships, stunning 12v12 arenas. And Wales is not just adding extra ships and games though, the art team is always at work making the game prettier with every single patch. Like I can tell you back when the game first started versus now, chalk and cheese, the art team's done an incredible job. World of Warships has a passionate and dedicated fan base. Join the action in game and participate in discussions on the forums and the Discord channels. Tune into live streams or participate in tournaments. Find your community in World of Warships or even make your own clan. Oh, and if you don't have a PC, well guess what? They got you fam. Now I know what you're gonna say. Games available on console that, that are originally PC ports, they're not very good. Well, I actually thought that as well when they offered me this ad read, and I wasn't going to accept it until I checked it. So I downloaded it on my Xbox, and now I usually am not a fan of games like this on my Xbox, but it was a lot of fun. I genuinely enjoyed it quite a bit. Want to get started but don't know how? Well, click the link in the comment below and use the code WARSHIPS to get a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after 15 battles. That's right, you get a free ship. Really, thank you so much for Wargaming and World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Remember to use your code WARSHIPS to get free new goodies for new players. Now on to the video. The Battle of Jutland in 1916 is a bit of a fun one in the historical community. There is a large amount of people who firmly believe that Germany won this battle and that the so-called Spirit of Trafalgar was finally over, that Britain could and had been thoroughly defeated at sea. These people are not very smart, and we do not listen to them. The thing about Jutland, and no, this isn't the kind of video that's going to go over the battle step by step, watch Drakinefell or the Great War Channel for that, but this is more the perception of after the battle and who won it. And unfortunately, Jutland is often compared to other battles in history, such as Abakir Bay, also known as the Nile, and Trafalgar. There's a couple reasons for this, and the big one is public perception and propaganda. Now, anyone who hasn't looked at the news lately about the Ginger and the Winger knows that the British press can be particularly vicious. This has always been the case, and it was expected of the Royal Navy during the First World War that they would instantly just win every single battle. However, a slight issue with this is having so thoroughly emptied the ocean of anything larger than a canoe with a flag on it in the early 1800s, Britain had had a century of effectively fighting nobody. I'm not kidding by the way, the Royal Navy had so effectively wiped the sea that there was basically no other ships out there. After Trafalgar, the French Navy was thoroughly beaten so badly that it invented a whole new strategy called Je ne Col. Basically, we don't want to die anymore, let us just defend our coasts and use small boats to try and prick at the giant Royal Navy. Spain kind of faded into the background and Russia's navy as well. Need I say more? And it's not until the Germans start looking at the ocean that Britain gets a little concerned. So when the war rolls around, it's a case of the French going to the British and going, oh dear, Le Bosch is coming, please help protect Lissy. And I'm not kidding when I say that the British had nothing to do. Like, 
In the 1830s, when Greece declared its independence and the Ottoman navy was in fighting to, you know, control Greece again, the Royal Navy got involved and quite literally was told, keep the balance of power in the region, but they got a little overexcited and may have completely wiped the Ottoman and Egyptian fleets because they had nothing to do. And if you leave a bunch of men alone with giant warships and nothing to do, they're going to blow up the enemy that they can find. But anyway, back to the pre-war. Presentation and flag waving sort of became the primary duty for the Royal Navy. And this was a particularly vicious wake-up call to this after the Battle of Coronel. Well, there was a wake-up call to everyone but that ingrate David Beatty. Yeah, I know he was helpful to the Navy post-war politically, but way too many young boys died because of this absolute twat of a man, honestly. Now, Beatty, however pompous and arrogantly stupid he was, was a product of his time, and his decision to leave open things like blast doors and store cordite explosives across his ships were the result to hit the subversion of, and training and obsession with looking good. The battle cruiser, for all its flaws, was not a broken design, as much as your average American with cable TV and the History Channel subscription will like to scream in the comments on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, don't go into, like, warship fan groups on Twitter or, like, warship aficionado or like 21st century battleship fans just don't it's like i i would rather eat eat glass put it that way then go back to them the battle cruiser regularly fought well and it did its job while taking a hell of a beating just look at this example of hms tiger after the battle of jutland and see the hits she took invincible and indefatigable were unfortunately simply too old and they were just overmatched like their armor was too weak they were not built to fleet screen they were effectively were just overmatched their age was too much and Queen Mary here, though, is the sole responsibility of David Beatty. The loss of HMS Queen Mary is the sole responsibility of David Beatty's practices. And had the captain of HMS Tiger listened to Beatty, you'd see Tiger on the bottom too. It's the fact that he didn't that the ship was fine. Anyway, that's reason one. Reason two why people think the Germans won the battle is, well, they said so. I'm, I'm not even kidding. The Germans said, we won. And Britain took its time in saying anything because, well, where the Battle of Jutland took place is a lot closer to Wilhelmshaven than it is to the Scarpa Flow and the Firth of the Fourth. The British ships were still coming back to port and they had to go to multiple ports because the Royal Navy was so big. So they weren't exactly sure when the ships started arriving what had happened. It was clear something had happened, just not exactly what. And due to this, the Royal Navy elected to not report anything definitive and they stayed at sea a little while longer. Jutland being, like I said, effectively Germany's home waters at this time. Well, they were able to go back, put the news out, say, hey, we won, and spread it across the airwaves as fast as possible. British media, naturally being British media, jumped onto it and said, oh my gosh, the Bosch won, the Bosch won. And the American media did not help as well because they ran with it as well. And the public being the public, only having access to one source, kind of ran with it. See that today a lot, don't you? So the next time someone tells you, you know, a certain country is finished because a single Leopard 2A6 was abandoned and therefore everything has failed. Stop and wonder where things came from. Or, like, it's it's 2023. You have access to the internet. These people didn't. You have no excuse to be this silly. The fundamental truth about Jutland, and really all battles when you consider who won, is there's a simple three-step process. What was the goal of each side? The state of each side after the battle? And the overall impact on the conflict? Now, the last one requires some hindsight and can really only be written after the war, but let's apply this to Jutland. First one, what was the goal? This one's pretty simple. The Germans wanted to break the naval blockade, the British wanted to maintain it. The German plan was to bait a portion of the British fleet, destroy it, and then achieve supremacy. If necessary, do this multiple times, which would then force the British out of the war and to the table for negotiation. Given that the French army was beaten six ways from Sunday by La Boche from 1914 to 1916 and they were bled effectively white at Verdun, this isn't an insult to the French army, they fought magnificently at Verdun. And the French navy didn't basically exist in any way they could fight the Germans, in the North Sea at least, they were busy in the med with the Austrians who they had much better chance of dealing with. It would have been absolutely war winning. No Royal Navy means no British Empire, no British Empire means that the German offensive will win. It, it just simply will. And the Royal Navy's goal is essentially just to keep the Germans bottled up. That's all the Royal Navy wanted to do. They wanted to keep the Germans bottled up. They wanted to prevent them from breaking into the North Sea. That's it. If the Germans just went home, the Royal Navy would win. Make sense? So, state of the two sides after the battle. Now, this is where it gets interesting. 
This is where that Germany won argument falls off pretty damn hard. The Royal Navy lost more men at sea, this is a fact, and more ships. Often that this is pointed to is to why the Germans won, because big number. Fundamentally though, this is a moot point. The state of the German Navy after this battle was that the fleet could not even begin to sortie until 1918. With von der Tan being so damaged, like she didn't have any working weaponry left. The Lutzau, brand new battlecruiser, was on the bottom, and the Seedlitz was such a wreck that she sank at her moorings the moment she made it back to port. You imagine being a dockyard worker, sitting in port, and you see the Seedlitz come in and it just comes up to its dock and goes plop, it just sinks. The Royal Navy, meanwhile, it was damaged, but it was in a far better state, given that how the battle played out, the 5th Battle Squadron with Queen Elizabeth class Super Dreadnoughts took most of the damage alongside the battle cruisers. The bulk of the Grand Fleet was, relatively speaking, fine, with minimal damage. As such, the British could take these losses and afford it, and while retaining complete supremacy. The performance of the Queen Elizabeth is of particular note in this battle, and genuinely I could and might do a video on them alone, particularly considering this battle begins the myth that is HMS Warspite, with its plot armour to survive anything. Now we get on to point three, the impact on the conflict. Jutland, again, ignoring the silly people, did have a tremendous impact on the course of the First World War. There's this weird sort of post-war revisionist twaddle that says Jutland had no impact on the war, but it had an incredible impact on the war. Jellicoe could, as was put by Winston Churchill, lose the war in a single afternoon if he mucked it up. The fact was, his seamanship and his skill at command prevented any German breakout or isolation and defeat of Beatty. The German fleet was then mauled so horrifically by the Grand Fleet that it refused to try it again, and when the German Admiralty wanted them to try it again in 1918, the crews mutinied to refuse to go and fight the Royal Navy. Three points here. They all go to Britain winning the battle. Any argument I have seen that say Germany wanted to win the battle was, well, it wasn't the Germans' goal to defeat the Royal Navy. Yes, it was. Fundamentally, their goal was to isolate and defeat the Royal Navy. That was the whole point. That was the strategy. And when they turned and ran, they got beat. Now, you can say the tactical victory. Well, no, Germany actually surrendered the field of battle as well. And strategically, it is exactly what Britain needed. They wanted Germany to attack them to take damage, and then to retreat. They didn't help, not even take damage, they just wanted Germany to stay in port. They just wanted to maintain that blockade. There was no necessity for a Trafalgar-esque, you know, sink the whole German fleet at once. It would have been nice, would have completely shattered German resolve, and probably could have ended the war faster, but it wasn't a necessity. It wasn't worth the risk. And in many ways, you see why Jellico makes the decisions he does throughout the battle. He is avoiding the risk of losing the war in a single afternoon. So again, I'm just going to say this once for the people in the back who didn't hear it. Turn the History Channel off. Turn it off. You will be smarter for it. The simple fact is, when Sheer and Hipper saw Jellicoe's ships appear on that horizon that afternoon, when they turned in line and row after row after row of guns lit up in the night sky in the largest, most awesome display of firepower in human history, when the German admirals finally got the battle they'd been itching for, since the formation of the German Empire, and keep in mind, Kaiser Wilhelm II took the German Navy, who was itching for this battle, and made it big with the idea of destroying the Royal Navy. When they finally got that, and they finally saw across the horizons, they didn't see Jellicoe or Beatty. Not, not alone, at least. When the German animals looked at, across that horizon, they saw Nelson, they saw Collingwood, they saw Cochrane, they saw Jervis, Howe, Ansard, Rodney, Hawke, Drake, and all the rest. And in that crucial moment, the German admirals saw what they were facing and they ran as fast as they could back to Wilhelmshaven because they would have been absolutely destroyed had they not. The Royal Navy, despite its faults, is and was a paragon of excellency at sea. The outliers such as Beatty and his flag captain are absolute morons for what the decisions they made, but you can understand why they made the decisions to an extent based on context at the time. And the moment those decisions were revealed to be bad, they were fixed. There is a bit of a fun anecdote to this whole video though. The only enemy who can defeat the Royal Navy is quite honestly number 10 Downing Street. There is a bit of a saying when it comes to the British Empire and well, British imperialism in general. 
the British gained their empire despite their government. And when, I mean, given the fact a lettuce outlasted the last Prime Minister, it's not entirely shocking now, is it? If you enjoyed the video, uh, this is a bit of a bonus one for the for the month. Um, I wasn't going to do it, but World of Warships did reach out, so happy to make it. Now, uh, please feel free to join the Discord, like, comment, subscribe, and thank you again to World of Warships. Remember code WARSHIPS to get your freebies. And uh, if you add me in the game, I will try and log on this weekend with some time and see if I've got any friend requests.